Now, the Fed can print all the money they want. And they can buy all the bonds they want. There's no numeric limit on what the Fed can do, but there's a confidence limit. There's a trust limit. November 2014, Brisbane, Australia. It was a G20 meeting. And that was not long after the 2008 global financial crisis. And the biggest thing that came out of 2008 was people were enraged at the way taxpayer money was used to bail out all the big banks. So with very few exceptions, Lehman, an obvious one, but with very few exceptions, none of the bank failed. Nobody got fired. Nobody got arrested. They kept their bonuses. They kept everything. And you know, the stocks went down, but the stocks came back. Um, and it was all done with taxpayer money. And people were like, hey, I lost my job or my business shut or uh, my portfolio got trashed or whatever. But Jamie Dimon's getting, you know, he's a billionaire. How do you get to be a billionaire, by the way, CEO of a bank? It's another question. But um, so so the politicians knew that there had that they could not do that again. And they were right. So in Brisbane, they they said we're getting rid of bailouts and we're going to have bail ins. And this was in this is all in writing. This is in the declarations. So uh, what's a bail-in? Well, a bail-in says when the bank fails, we're not going to go for taxpayer money. We're not going to go for government money. We're going to whack the, the right-hand side of the balance sheet, the capital account and the liability account until we fill the hole on the balance sheet. So start with stockholders. They get nothing. But bondholders, they might get nothing. We're not bailing out bondholders anymore. Depositors, you'll get your deposit insurance, which is 250000 in the U.S. I think it's 100,000 euros. Um, you know, different amounts around the world. You'll get your deposit insurance, no worries. But anything beyond that, you're at risk. And whether we take 20% or 30%, whatever, we'll take as much as we need to um, to fill the hole in the balance sheet to cover the lost, the, the lost assets. And only when we wiped out everything will we even consider government aid. So that's a bail-in. Okay. There were no major bank failures between 2014 and 2023. There just weren't. That was the rule, and uh, I guess I'm enough of a geek that I studied it at the time. But I'm kind of like, oh, I'm waiting for the bail-in, you know? Um, well, okay, so when Silicon Valley Bank was taken over on March 10th, 2023, the FDIC, that's our insurance agency, issued a press release. And they said they applied the bail-in rule. They said um, deposits are guaranteed up to $250,000, but beyond that, your deposit is gone. They didn't say it was frozen or locked up it was gone you gone they gave you what they called a receivership certificate because the bank was put into receivership they said you know it's just yang money it's just you know it's, a, it's an iou basically and they said we will uh pay that off as and when we sell assets so let us sell the assets get money uh when that's going to happen don't know now you can go back to our the resolution trust corporation and in, uh, in 1990 it took them two years to clean up the snl crisis so Two years was a reasonable estimate. Uh, how much? No idea, because we got to sell the assets and see how that goes. So um, so that was the deal. Well, over the weekend, I called the billionaire crybabies, came out in force, and they were banging on the White House. You can't do this. You're going to wipe out all the entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, all these startups. They're, they're not going to be able to make their payroll. They can't pay the rent. They're going to shut down. Unemployment's going to go up. We're going to lose. Just crying, crying, crying. Um, and the White House caved. So Sunday, the 12th, at uh, March 12th at 6, at 6 p.m. I said, well, watch the 6 o'clock hour on Sunday nights, by the way. That's when they do stuff to get ready for the next day. Um, they said, just kidding. Uh, we're, we're, we're insuring all the deposits without limit. Now, here's the thing on Silicon Valley Bank. 97% of the deposits were uninsured. It's And by the way, that's a new metric. If you're trying to judge the safety of your bank, look at the ratio of uninsured deposits to total deposits. If that's more than about 30%, I'd get my money out of that bank because the more uninsured you have, the more risk there is that the regulators don't do the same thing next time. Uh, so that's number one. But um, they guarantee all the deposit, uh, about $140 billion um, without limit. And by the way, little entrepreneurs, yeah, they were out there. Although if you, uh, most of these companies are going to fail anyway, for starters. Number two, uh, if you're any good, you ought to be able to call up your venture capital firm and say, hey, my deposits are tied up. Give me a million dollar bridge loan so I can keep my doors open and, you know, pay, I'll pay back when I collect on the certificate. Um, but they didn't do any of that. Some of those deposits, one of them was from a crypto exchange that had three billion dollars. So why is the FDIC using three billion dollars of the insurance fund to bail out an oversized deposit of a crypto exchange? 
Oh, there's a there's a question I don't have a good answer for. Um, and and there were big front Roku, uh, Cisco, uh, eBay. Uh, sorry, not eBay, Etsy. There were a lot of big firms in Silicon Valley Bank. So they were bailing out the big guys. But the other thing that uh, I, I kind of dug out, it's, it's been reported on, but most people didn't realize. Everyone's like, oh, Silicon Valley Bank's doing all this technology. Well, they started, everyone's thinking like apps or, you know, it was a climate bank. It was a climate change bank. The, the tech startups that they were financing were working on battery technology, wind turbines, um, you know, CO2 alternative. The whole climate change thing is a hoax to begin with. So, so you have a, you have a climate change bank with climate change startups working on a hoax, but that's what got the White House's attention because they're all into the, they call it the Green New Deal. I call it the Green New Scam. We don't have to spend too much time on climate change, but that's, that's why they did it. Okay. So now, um, it's Monday morning and your deposits are fine, but everyone's asking themselves, well, what, what's going to happen the next time? Does that mean that we're guaranteeing all deposits in the country all the time? That's not the law, but that's what they did. And then Janet Yellen comes out and says, maybe, <laughs> she says, if you're a systemically important bank, we may have to do that to save the system. So, well, is my bank systemically important? I mean, I, I have some money in a bank here in town. It's set up in 1877. They've been around, but, you know, they're not that big. So I don't, I don't think they're systemically important. But that's the point. Now they've thrown a cloud of uncertainty around the entire deposit structure of the U.S. banking system, leaving aside what I said earlier, which is that they bailed out every bank in the country in terms of underwater bond portfolios. So this is the biggest bailout in history. When you look at what the Fed and the Treasury put their guarantee around and extended to the banking system, this is by far the biggest bailout in history. It goes back to what I said before about the sequence of crises in my case, in my lifetime, in my as a professional, it goes back to 1974. You can go back further in history. Um, we keep having these crashes, but each bailout gets bigger than the one before. Uh, the 2008 bailout was bigger than 1998, the 2020 bailout, et cetera. And now 2023, we bailed out everything, trillions of dollars with all kinds of implications for monetary policy. So that's the case. So at what point does the next bailout get so big that it's bigger than the Fed? It's actually bigger. Now, the Fed can print all the money they want, and they can buy all the bonds they want. There's no numerical limit on what the Fed can do, but there's a confidence limit. There's a trust limit. At what point do, do people wake up and say, you know what, I see what they're doing, but get me out of here. Like, I, I, don't, I don't think, I think the Fed's in over their heads. I, I don't believe what they're saying, et cetera. And then you get back to gold and silver. So um, I think my view, we're at that point. They've, they've gone as far as they can go. Once you've guaranteed every deposit and every bond, what else is there to guarantee? And, and, it's, and it's still not working. So, um, so we're going to see more bank crises. I don't want to, you know, target anybody, but you know, we all know the list of banks, whether it's Deutsche Bank or Barclays or HSBC or City or they've all Morgan Stanley. They've all been in, in, in distress at one point or another, certainly in 2008. And some of them are always the weak sisters that get mentioned every time. Um, so, uh, there'll be more of them. And, uh, but at what, at what point does it morph from a crisis of confidence in the financial system to a crisis of confidence in the dollar itself? And that's what I would watch out for.